Hi, thanks for joining me. I'm Sue, and this is the introduction to the Bible book of Micah. Now, if you've if you followed any of my other introductions, you know that I have a stack of resources that I glean from to present this overview to you. Um, I've kind of distilled them down. This time, I think I've got seven of them because I just found out after doing so many. I think this is maybe my sixth to eighth or ninth, something like that. But there's some that I just don't want to use. They don't they don't have enough new information from the other resources to make it worth looking at them. So I'm trying to distill the, the introduction down a little bit. Now they do repeat themselves because they're each given their own kind of overview of the book. So sometimes I'm just gleaning out the new information and sometimes I'm allowing them to repeat themselves just to reinforce it in our mind and they might give a little little different twist. So we're looking at things like the author, the the settings and the background, the context, maybe significant scriptures, what makes this book different than other books, you know, what makes Micah as a minor prophet different from the other minor prophets, and any other little tidbits we can glean out that's going to help us when we actually open up the book and start reading it, um, which by the way, this one I think is read in one setting, it's so short, but that way when we open up and start reading it, we have a framework for understanding it, it isn't just going in there blind, right? So we're starting with Know the Bible Illustrated by Paul Kent, and you should be able to find the references in the video, YouTube video description if you want to know uh, more information about who they are. But this one says, um, the author and the date, it says, the word of the Lord, it quotes Micah 1, it says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite. Micah the Morishite. Now again, if you've listened by now, you know that I'm just building information. It's going to build on top of itself. So we're just starting to lay a couple foundation stones for this book. So, so follow me on this. It's a, kind of a unique way of doing it, but it will help you because by the time I'm done, you're going to remember some of these things. So it quotes Micah 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morishite. It says Micah either wrote the prophecies or dictated them to another, written approximately 700 B.C., so real close to the other ones we've been looking at. It says, Micah chastises both the northern and southern Jewish nations for pursuing false gods and cheating the poor. The two nations will be devastated by invaders, the Assyrians, but God will preserve, excuse me, I'm stumbling. The two nations will be de devastated by the Assyrians, but God will preserve the remnant of Israel. So that's everything in a nutshell. The purpose, you know, the the... I've heard more than one minister now say that when when leaders go rogue, they're out of control, they need correction, God sends a prophet. The prophets come on the scene. And here it is again. Micah chastises both the northern and the southern Jewish nations. Now you remember that the kingdom of Israel was divided at this time. Um, just keep reinforcing this for anyone that's just listening for the first time and doesn't know this. Um, Israel, uh, God created the, the people of Israel, gave them judges to rule them. They wanted kings, they had three kings, and then the kingdom divided into two. So Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south, okay? Up north, Israel had 10 tribes, and down south, Judah had two, Judah and Benjamin. And Jerusalem with the temple was in that southern kingdom. So get a visual in your mind. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And since we've been reading through the major and minor prophets, we saw the, the prophetic utterances of the prophets would be directed at certain certain nations and people groups. Well, this time it's directed to both Israel and Judah. So that makes it a little bit unique. Um, one of the scriptures, oh, my favorite, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It says, it's from Micah 6, 8. It says, he hath showed, he has shown, oh, this is in King James. It says, he hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. But to do justly, to have mercy, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Okay, and then it says, unique and unusual about this book. Centuries before Jesus' birth, Micah predicted the town where it would occur. Quote, but thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. That's Micah 5 2. So bear with me. I haven't read King, King James in years. <clears throat> I'm kind of stumbling over it. The next resource is the Bible uh, Rose Publishing Bible Overview. And the subtitle of their section on Micah actually um, restates that scripture in simplicity. It says, seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. Seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. So this one says, the purpose of Micah. 
Micah prophesied against the leaders of his people for their injustice, greed, and lack of humility or pride. Micah brought word about God's justice, the destruction of Samaria, the capital of Israel, and the fall of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. So there you see Samaria in Israel and Jerusalem in Judah. However, the prophet also proclaimed a vision of redemption and forgiveness. Micah promised that a remnant would return, regain their inheritance, and worship the Lord. True worship looks a certain way, according to Micah 6, 8, quote, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God, unquote. So then it has a little timeline. And just to, just to give you again, for those visual, visual learners out there, um, we just went through, um, well, let's just put it this way. You have Jonah who prophesied, and then Amos started prophesying right at the tail end of Jonah. And then Hosea started prophesying almost after Amos, just at the end, tail end of him too. And then Micah started prophesying right in the middle of Hosea. So they're not actually in that order in the Bible though, but it goes Jonah, then Amos, then Hosea, then Micah. And the fall of Israel in the north to Assyria, when Assyria invaded Israel in the north, um, Micah was on the scene then. So he, it happened about halfway through his, his ministry when Israel fell. That must have been devastating because they didn't heed the warnings of the prophets. Amos had also prophesied to them. So this book gives an outline of six, six bullet points. The judgment of Israel and Judah. Number two, restoration of Israel and Judah. Number three, leaders and prophets rebuked. Number four, hope and redemption. There's always that, isn't there? Every single time to, to what I remember from these books all the way from Lamentations to here. Um, so that was hope and redemption. Five, God's case against Israel, which brings us to that, that principle that I have been reinforcing that it's like God is bringing them to court. He's bringing them to court and giving the list of indictments against them. Um, that, you know, to put it in terms of our modern U.S. Uh, court system, you could say the, um, you know, the penalty or the sentence that was going to come against them if they didn't repent. But he always gave time and opportunity for them to repent. Always gave them time. And then, um, and in the case like we saw in the last book with Nineveh, they did repent and they, they missed the judgment. They acknowledged the prophet's words and um, they repented. Okay, and then finally, number six, it says the final restoration of Israel. Now here's a little background. This one says for the author, Micah, whose name means who is like Yahweh? Who is like Yahweh? He was from the town of Moresheth, often identified with Moresheth Gath, located southwest of Jerusalem. So now there's another visual for your geography. Southwest of Jerusalem, down like looking toward Egypt. And then it says the prophet's name is a reminder of the confession who is a God like you from Micah 7. Um, he lived at the same time as Isaiah and was mentioned later by Jeremiah. So there's more puzzle pieces of how they fit in with the, the bigger picture of the Bible. For the date, it says Micah began his prophetic career during the reign of King Jotham, <clears throat> excuse me, through the reign of King Ahaz and completed his prophecies during the reign of Hez King Hezekiah. So there's three kings. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. It says many scholars suggest a date for his ministry and perhaps the book from 738 to 698 BC. So the main thing there is, is the three kings. For his audience, Micah was from the town of Judah, but his primary audience was the northern kingdom of Israel. In parentheses, it says Samaria and the city of Jerusalem, the northern kingdom of Israel or Samaria. And see, that's one of the things that can get us mixed up if we don't do these kind of pre-studies before we read a book. And that is when they change names on you, right? Like, for instance, um, in the example of Babylon, when King Nebuchadnezzar invaded, well, those were Chaldean people. I think originally, I'm not sure how that worked, but it might refer to them as Chaldeans. It might refer to them as Babylonians, right? And then, you know, or talk about Nebuchadnezzar. And if you don't realize they're all the same thing, then you get a little bit confused. <clears throat> so this is um, Israel or Samaria. Okay, um, and it says Jesus, oh wait, there's themes. There's four themes. God judges and punishes disobedience. Now it calls them themes, but I want to call them principles because this is one of those key things I would say we get out of the Bible by just simply reading it as you begin to see principles of life. 
life principles, spiritual principles, practical principles, and you see them throughout scripture. And once you kind of, it, it gives you an understanding of how they work. And then you can see them played out in your own life. And it, it helps. It, it brings wisdom. It brings decision-making capability. It's amazing how that works. <clears throat> so it says, God judges and punishes disobedience. God is loving and faithful to his promises. So those two right there, they even bring comfort. You know, when, when, when I lived in the world without God, I may not have been comforted by the fact that God judges and punishes disobedience because I didn't know it. And I've learned now he even vindicates. He vindicates us, not just in the world to come, but it's in his hands, in his time, in his way. Because the Bible says, uh, God said, vindication is mine, says the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Excuse my stumbling, y'all. This is totally ad lib, and I want it to be that way. I want it to be kind of conversational, and I want I want to kind of lead you along in your thinking. So I hope that's working for you. So I'm going to start at the beginning of those. So God judges and punishes disobedience, one. Two, he is loving and faithful to his promises. Three, he hates injustice, idolatry, greed, lack of mercy, and empty ritualistic religion. And four, God desires mercy, humility, and justice. And that includes social justice, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, because it's a big issue in our day right now. And God is the one that understands and knows how to institute social justice, okay? When we're left to our own devices, we mess it all up. And that's a lot of the problems we're seeing around the world right now. Okay, and then this one restates that beautiful scripture that I love, but it's not in King James, so I'm going to read it. It says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's Micah 6, 8. That's a good one to memorize. And then it says, Being God's people... In a time of great upheaval, God promised that his kingdom would reign eternally and the Messiah would deliver and redeem his people. Um, and then where's Jesus in this book? Because, you know, some say he's in every single book, and he is. Micah predicts the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, but more than that, this prophecy states that this shepherd will lead God's people into an eternal kingdom that will reach the ends of the earth. When the angel Gabriel announces the birth of Jesus to Mary, he told her that Jesus will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay. And now what the Bible is all about by Henrietta C. Mears. Let's see what she has to add. It says, Micah was a country preacher who lived in the days of Isaiah and Hosea. His home was about 20 miles south of Jerusalem in the town of Moresheth on the Philistine border. He was preaching there at the same time that Isaiah was preaching in Jerusalem and Hosea in Israel. So you can see, everybody's been warned. God sent prolific amount, ample amount of prophets to speak and warn. And I'm sure many people did repent. But uh, the leaders didn't, for one thing. Much could be said about that. But um, Micah was a prophet of the common people and country life. Isaiah preached to the court in the city of Jerusalem. Micah knew his fellow countrymen well. Read what he says um, his real equipment is. He said, but I truly am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah prophesied concerning Samaria, the capital of Israel, and Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. But the burden of his prophecy was for Judah. The times in which he lived were difficult. Oppression was within the walls and foes were coming from without. The condition, I love this background stuff, so you can, you can envision it. The condition was the same both for the kingdom of Judah and in the kingdom of Israel. The kings were, do you remember, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. The prophet denounced the social sins of the day. Micah felt keenly, felt keenly these social evils. He saw the unfair treatment of the poor by the rich. He felt that these sins cried up to heaven. No class was free from corrupting influences. Princes, priests, and people alike were all affected. Micah makes them all smart under the lash. Micah wanted, to, wanted the people to know that every cruel act to one's fellow man was an insult to God. I'm going to read that again. Michael make, Micah makes them smart under the lash. He wanted people to know that every cruel act to one's fellow man was an insult to God. God is offended by the conduct of the people and the rulers. In spite of the state of things, the people tried to carry on their religious observances. Micah shows the uselessness of all of this. Okay, now this, this says that the book's divided into three parts. And they are a promise of deliverance, a promise to overthrow the enemies of the land, and the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. 
That's it for that book. Now the Complete Jewish Bible by David Stern. It has a little blurb in the front that tells us a few more things about the setting in the background. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, although the book of Micah mentions the destruction of the northern kingdom, it focuses mainly on the southern kingdom. Jotham is cited as being a good king, but he fails to remove from Judah the high places where the pagans, pagan worship occurred. And the people of his realm continued acting corruptly. His su successor Ahaz is an evil king who makes molten images for Baal and offers his own sons as sacrifices to foreign gods. Did you know that's been going on? since the beginning and still continues today this worship of Baal or Molech yep it sure does um, and then it says in contrast to Ahaz the next king Hezekiah is anti-Assyrian one of the best kings of Judah he withstands Sennacherib's invasion of Jerusalem in 701 by seeking God in prayer and experiencing God's miraculous judgment on the Assyrian army you know you think if they knew that and I'm preaching to myself right now. You'd think if they knew God had done it before that they would just humble themselves and seek God. But no, they went on and, and were invaded. Um, it says, although the southern kingdom is spared from an Assyrian invasion, it encounters the growing Babylonian threat. In harmony with the other prophets, Micah proclaims God's judgment on Judah for failing to hold to the stipulations of the Mosaic covenant, Moses covenant. He preaches a message of God's hatred of sin and, and the love he has for his people. In chapter 6, God puts his people on trial for sin. Okay, remember, that's what we've been seeing every time. There's there's always this, like, it's just like with a trial. This is how I see it when I read it anyway. It's like a trial where there will always be this list of indictments. I know I already said this, but it's just like that. You know, here's what you're doing. Here's why it's wrong. Here's every all the destruction you're causing. And here's why judgment's going to come if you don't repent and change. So, so um, let me read this. It says, God puts his people on trial for sin declares them guilty, and assigns them a punishment of destruction and exile. However, God also promises to pardon their sin, using their punishment as a way of purifying them and drawing them back to himself. I picture that like just shaking them, you know, like, snap out of it, you're, you're hurting yourselves. I mean, they were putting their children through the fire. Think about that. And that's just, that's just part of what they were doing. And they were lying, cheating, backstabbing, just adultery, and all kinds of sexual sin, perversion, and just you name it. So it says, Micah describes a coming time of peace and prosperity when the Messiah will shepherd his people and rule over the whole world. God promises to rescue a remnant of his people from captivity, just as he had brought them out of Egypt. <clears throat> so at this point, do you have a picture forming in your mind? Who Micah was, who his audience was, you know, who, how he was prophesying to the kingdoms and, and why, why God sent him. Oops, my little sticky came out. Here it is. So this one is the Moody Commentary, Moody Bible Commentary. And this section is written by Daniel Green. And for the author, it says, The author of the book was Micah, a prophet God called to pronounce judgment on Israel. His hometown, Moresheth, was likely Moresheth Gath in the fertile hills. See, that's a little bit of added information. You can now envision even more. These fertile hills. You can picture things growing on those hills, shepherds, farmers. So it says, um, his hometown Morsheth was likely Morsheth Gath in the fertile hills of southwest of Jerusalem, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. His name means, who is like Yahweh? Although less prominent than his contemporary Isaiah, he was mentioned in, um, I guess that's Jeremiah, for his effective preaching. So he's an effective preacher. He was good. That's probably why he made it in the Bible, right? <laughs> that's why his scrolls were preserved, because he was powerful. It says, nothing else is known of him except what is revealed in the biblical text. Then skipping over, it says, for the purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose of the book is to demonstrate that true faith results in social justice and practical holiness. Y'all, please, please, while you're listening, pray for my voice. I'm determined it's not going to keep being scratchy while I'm trying to read. But it says um, something very important here. It says, true faith results in social justice and practical holiness. Exactly the opposite of socialist communist countries. Do you see that? Do you see how um, it's faith in God and walking in his ways, walking in truth, walking in light, walking in honesty. Um, you know, just look at the Ten Commandments of love. 
Look at, you know, look at all the, the Christianity 101 in the New Testament. These are the things that bring social justice. These are the things that bring peace to a nation. These are things that bring equity and equality, um, a, a peaceful society, right? And the Bible says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So it says here, true faith results in social justice and practical holiness. That is so important right now because social justice is a huge issue and controversy here in 2021 um, around the world, not just here in the U.S. So it says, with a view toward the ultimate reign of Messiah on the earth, the emphasis on social justice is evident in the censure of unlawful seizure of fields. Now, this is some of the things that this, the critical race theory recommends doing. And if you look here, it's the exact opposite of what's going to actually bring social justice because they want to have no personal ownership, no private property, right? This says um, the unlawful seizure, seizure of fields, theft, exploitation of women and children, corrupt leadership, unethical business practices, violence, and bribery. Nevertheless, a better future is foreseen when such sin will be banished as Messiah is born to reign righteously over Israel. And really, all this points to is there's nothing new under the sun, right? All the shenanigans going on in the earth right now, they've been going on forever. It's just man's sin. It's our sin. We are in need of a Savior, all of us. So it says, the book is clearly divided into three messages that follow the superscription. The divisions begin with the words, Hear, O peoples! And here now, the messages say that judgment will come, blessings will follow, and blessings will surpass the judgment. That's good news, and that's God's way. That's God's way. When he vindicates, he vindicates over and above. Um, another thought this made me think of was when it says, hear, O peoples, hear now. You know, we better open our ears when we hear that, right? Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I've seen people, like, there's times when I've said to somebody, you know, God showed me or God told me, and they're just oblivious. When I hear somebody say that, I'm all ears and eyes. I'm all listening. Tell me what God said. I'm hanging on their words, right? And I can judge it by my spirit and by the word of God, whether it's true or not, you know? And and um, so that doesn't matter. But I had people just, they don't, they don't value the word of God. They don't acknowledge the word of God. They're oblivious to their necessity of it. It goes with that scripture that says, truth lies fallen in the street. Just lies fallen. There's another one that says, wisdom cries out. And wisdom is always crying out, but are we listening? Do we have an ear to hear? So Micah starts out with, hear, O peoples, hear now. Um, and so again, the outline has four, the superscription, um, judgment will come, blessing will follow judgment, and the blessing will surpass the judgment. There's another section in this book that I want to point out. It says, um, it was given to Micah to be delivered to three kings of Israel, it concerned the impending judgment of Samaria and Jerusalem. Okay, remember, those are the two capitals. Samaria is the capital of Israel. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. And the capital cities of the northern and southern kingdom. Oh, well, the capital cities, just what I just said. Sorry. Um, it says, the command to listen is directed to the world. The phrases, hear, O people, and listen, O earth, are set in synonymous parallel. This is talking a little bit to the structure. It says they are identical in meaning summoning all people without exception to pay attention it's best to see the nations not as recipients of the prophesied judgments but as witnesses to what god was about to do among his own chosen people now we have vernon mcgee j vernon mcgee his outline notes on micah and for the writer he says his name means who is like jehovah uh, the word has the same derivation as Michael, which means who is like God. There are many Micahs in scripture, but this one is identified as a Morishite, since he was an inhabitant of Morasheth Gath, a place about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem. Now we know how long it's going to take us to get there, near Lachish. He is not to be confused with any other Micah in scripture. Very important when we're reading. I always want to know that when I read some of these names. I think, is that the same one? So that's a good thing to remember there. Micah, anywhere else in scripture? Well, actually, though, isn't this a contradiction to what we just read? Because somebody said it was mentioned in Jeremiah. So, hmm, who's right? All right, for time, it says, Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah and prophesied during the, the three kings, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. He was younger than Isaiah, and his prophecy might be called a miniature Isaiah, or Isaiah in shorthand, that's interesting, since there are striking similarities. Ewald and Wellhausen, I guess those are authors or scholars. 
Ewald and Wellhausen attack the unity of this book in the same attack which has been made against Isaiah. All right, then it says, um, style. For many, this is a favorite of the minor prophets. The writing is pungent and personal. Micah was trenchant, touching, and tender. He was realistic and rep reportorial, repertorial. I forget what that means. So let me back up. I love I love the way Jay Vernon adds these these little almost like quips. He usually adds a little humorous attitude about the prophet, something personal. So it says, for many, this is the favorite of the minor prophets. The writing is pungent and personal. Micah was trenchant, touching, and tender. He was realistic and repertorial. He would have made a good war correspondent. There is an exquisite beauty about this brochure which combines God's infinite tenderness with his judgments. There are several famous passages which are familiar to the average Christian. Through the gloom of impending judgment, Micah saw clearly the coming glory of the redemption of Israel. He goes on to say, Micah pronounced judgment on the cities of Israel and Jerusalem. These centers influence the people of the nation. Micah condemns urban problems that sound very much like our present day problems, violence, corruption, robbery, covetousness, gross materialism and spiritual bankruptcy, he could well be labeled the prophet of the city. Okay, and one more. This is uh, Dr. Hayford's Hayford Bible Handbook, and he links Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah all together. So this is the third of the trilogy. We just finished going through Obadiah, Jonah, and Michael, and pretty rapidly because they're so short. And that's why they're called the Minor Prophets, because they're short in length, not because of their importance. So don't leave them out of your Bible study. So it says, Keys to Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah, a trilogy on the king's global standards of mercy and justice. So there's global standards. I don't care what religion you are, what culture you are, what how old you are, how wealthy you are. God has standards for the earth, and they are for every single one of us. And that's what he's saying, this global standards of mercy and justice. He's a merciful and loving God. He will warn us. He will let us know. If you go that way, it's going to hurt you, right? He set things up to work a certain way, and they work that way, heavenly, in a heavenly way. But if we go against his ways, all kinds of problems crop up. So over here about specifically Micah, he says, Micah was a contemporary with Isaiah in the 8th century before Christ. Both concentrated their ministry in the southern kingdom, Judah, yet included Samaria slash Israel and the nations within their scope of their prophecies. Yeah, because all the nations around them were just as cray cray. So it says for a few years in his early career, Micah also was contemporary with Hosea, a prophet located in the northern kingdom. Micah lived in a town about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem and prophesied mostly in that region. Micah's name predicts a likeness to the Lord. He who was like Yahweh, Micah was so completely and sincerely committed that he was even willing to go stripped naked on occasion to get his message across. Micah's prophecy had an impact that extended far beyond his local ministry. It's impacting us today, isn't it? A century later, his prophecy was remembered and quoted in Jeremiah, and events seven centuries later attest to the authenticity of Micah's prophecy. In the period between the beginning of the divided kingdom and the destruction of the temple many high places had been introduced in judah through the influence of sumeria this placed canaanite idolatry in competition with the true temple worship of the lord micah shows how the spiritual declension will inevitably lead to judgment on the whole land see they curse their land with this idolatry witchcraft sorcery you name it it's all lumped in the same bucket in my book uh, um, and they were worshiping other gods right and although King Hezekiah had won a notable victory over Sennacherib and the Assyrian army, Judah was bound to fall unless the nation turned back to God in wholehearted repentance. Nothing's changed, y'all. This is why we need a revival in America and the world. We need the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come on our hearts. We must repent and come before the Lord in humility, right? Cleansing our hearts. Search my heart, O God, and see if there be any unclean thing in me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's no other way. And listen, if you haven't given Jesus uh, your life yet, what are you waiting for? The Bible says, um, 
all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wage of that sin is destruction in this life and the one to come, hell. And the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. When you receive that gift by faith, that shed blood of Jesus that paid for your sins, you receive a new spirit inside of you. Be born again. And you begin this walk with God, which will grace you to obey him. You know, prior to that, the Bible says our sin controls us. We are a slave to sin. That's one of the freedom. It said it was for freedom that Christ came to set us free. When he was on earth, he healed. He set free from devils. He cast out devils. He set people free. Emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, right? So if you haven't done that yet, do it today. And don't take my word for it. Ask him. He'll show you. Christianity is experiential. You know God. And when you know him, you'll know that you know that you know. You don't have to wonder. So seek him today. Stop right now. Pause the video. Call on the Lord. Ask him to come in your heart. He said, when you do that, he will send the Holy Spirit to be your comforter and your God. He'll be with you in spirit. And he will. And he does. And you'll know. Okay. It's a personal, a real life personal relationship with him through the spirit and through the word of God. And then get in your Bible and read it some more. Put my videos on. Get that word in your heart. So um, back up here. I was reading. They were bound to fall unless a nation turned back to God in wholehearted repentance. Micah's introductory statement is in prose form. So this is a literary style. Just real quick on this, not much. But it was in prose form in the introductory statement. But the entire compilation of prophecies after that is poetry. This is going to be good. The advantage of poetry to his contemporaries was that with the rhythmic message, it would be easier to remember. The disadvantage to us is, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize, just interpreting it. Interpreting it properly, right? And it says, Micah depends on shortened units of thought um, and poetic prepositions. He also uses an abundance of word pictures. For instance, instead of abstractly saying the Lord will can uh, conceal or otherwise make invisible our sins, he declares, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He cannot avoid the abstract word sins, but he correct, uh, um, concretely depicts for us their burial like weights into the ocean depths, never to be recovered. All right, this book has a couple more little snippets in here that were so good, I, I couldn't leave them out. It says, in the opening vision, the Lord comes from his holy sanctuary in heaven to witness against his people. So there he is coming into the courtroom, if you will. The most remarkable factor in the Lord's handling of his case is how far down he has come to make his complaint even being willing to sit at the defendant's table and let his people bring any grievances with the way God has treated them. Moreover, one who truly repents will have the Lord as his defense lawyer. How about that? That's true of us today. We'll have the Lord as his defense lawyer if you repent. Isn't that true of us as Christians today? Jesus is our advocate. He ever lives to intercede for us. If we just come to him with a pure and repentant heart, he intercedes for us. He defends us. He vindicates us. Yes, and I've seen him do it. If you're wronged, take a step back. Let God do the vindicating, okay? Let God do it. Um, then it says, Micah had to censure the leadership of the nation for consuming the flock with which they were entrusted. Again, when leaders go rogue, right? Prophets come on the scene. I heard that from two different people recently. One was a newer, uh, more recent contemporary prophet, and one was another writer I read. And the, the contemporary one was um, Robin Bullock. So Micah had to censor um, because they weren't doing their job, basically. Nevertheless, God's great compassion colors his every attitude and action toward his people. Remember, I keep saying that. He always has hope, always has mercy, always has a door of hope. There's always an opportunity for you. There's always time for you. Until there's not. It's not an unlimited open-ended invitation, right? But it says, uh, his every attitude and action toward his people portrayed as an errant daughter. For his compassion that once redeemed Israel from Egypt will also redeem Judah from Babylon. You see, it's like a parent. You know, there's nothing my kids could ever do that would make me turn from them. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's the hardest thing for a parent when they have a child who, who keeps getting in trouble and they don't want to keep bailing them out because it's, you know, it's codependent. And if there's nothing you wouldn't do for your children. And there's children who rip their parents around by doing that because the parents just can't say no to them. But it's the love of a parent toward their children. There's, there's no way around that unless somebody's, you know, there's those that have been mentally ill or whatever. But, you know, the love of a mom for her children, don't, don't even. So it says, um, and a father, of course, too. 
So this message is focused on the one central question for the entire prophecy. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Yahweh's compassion is the precious attribute no false deity can match. Compassion and covenant faithfulness are unique with God. Love this. The people's hope to live under God's full blessing was bound up with the coming of the Messiah. God in his love, foreseeing the glories of his grace to be manifested in Jesus, kept declaring that future day and kingdom as the event in which the faithful should place their hopes. Micah's prophecy, I think this is last, yeah, lastly, Michael's prophecy should make everyone stand in awe of the incomparable Yahweh who revealed himself in the humanity of Jesus as the compassion and truth of God personified. All right, well, I hope that gave you a good foundation for reading the book. That's it for today. If you want to be notified when the next video launches, be sure to click the bell. Um, well, click subscribe with the little bell to let you know. Feel free to comment your thoughts about today's segment. And then down in the video description, you'll find out how to get your free one-year Bible, the reference list of the books that I used today for the intro, and links for all the Bible play, uh, reading playlists. So if you want, you can continuously listen to those when you're out doing your tasks, you know, exercising or working or what driving, what have you. And um, Get that word embedded in your heart like we're supposed to, right? And here's a hot tip. If you sign up for YouTube Premium, yes, it's a monthly subscription, but to me, so worth it. It's one of the few ones I'll, I'll ever do. Um, but you can listen in the background. So you can do other things on your phone while you're listening to it. And you can turn your screen off on your phone. You know, put it in your pocket, listen to your earbuds. Um, you don't even have to have your phone screen on. You can still hear it. And these are audio, so you don't need to watch it, right? So you can use it when you're driving or working and stuff like I just said. So that's it. Until next time, God bless you. Okay, well listen, please comment your thoughts about today's segment. I welcome your input. Then down in the description, you'll find great things like how to get your free copy of the One Year Bible. There are links for the playlist for the Bible reading so you can continuously listen and get that word hidden or embedded in your heart like we're instructed to do. Um, if you set up a YouTube premium account, you can listen in the background or when your screen is turned off. I love that aspect about uh, YouTube premium. And if you want to be notified when the next video launches, be sure to click subscribe with the bell. Until next time, God bless you. Thanks for joining.